First in New Sense 48. WBAP, Fort Worth, Dallas. Say when, sponsored by Reynolds Metals and Sterling Drugs, will not be seen today in order that we may bring you the presidential breakfast direct from the Grand Ballroom of the Hotel Texas in Fort Worth. Gentleman appearance at the parking lot across the street from the hotel and he is on his way up. We expect him to walk through this door at any moment. The crowd has been here since early this morning and when he addressed the group in the parking lot across the street, there were apparently three to four thousand persons. This is just a guesstimate as officials say. The crowd had continued to build and probably will continue to build throughout this half hour event here at the Hotel Texas because many people want to see the president when he leaves to go to Carswell Air Force Base. The two thousand guests here in the ballroom have already had breakfast. They are waiting and so in one sense the presidential breakfast title is misleading because the president will walk in just in time to sit down and uh, make his address to the people. He should start talking within about seven or eight minutes, assuming he arrives within the next few minutes. And he plans to speak for 20 minutes. However, his schedule is so tight, he's due in Dallas in less than two and a half hours. Uh, he may not speak that long. He may tailor his speech to fit the time available. At 5.30 this morning, people were already waiting outside. And at 5.30, there was a heavy rain coming down. It was strange to see that the parking lot uh, or several of the parking lots around the hotel were already filled at 5.30 in the morning. It looked more like about 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night in downtown Fort Worth. Coming into the ballroom with the governor, will, uh, the president will be Governor John Conley, Senator Ralph Yarborough, and Vice President Lyndon Johnson. The rest of the head table has already been seated. They came in about uh, 17 minutes ago. We understand that the president is just about ready to come in through, he'll come in through the kitchen incidentally as a security measure and will leave the same way. There had been plans for him to leave from here in an open car. A convertible is parked outside but with the rain falling the way it is it's fairly certain that the top will be up. His route to Carswell is as follows for those who may want to get a chance to look at him when he goes uh, leaves the hotel here up Main Street to Belknap then out Belknap to Jacksboro out Jacksboro to River Oaks Boulevard then to Roaring Springs Road and on to Carswell Air Force Base more than 1,000 students at River Oaks Elementary School will be out of class for a few minutes so they can see the president's motorcade go by at Carswell they were bored Air Force One that's the president's jet transport fly to Dallas for a greeting there and for our Dallas viewers, the motorcade downtown will go Lemon to Turtle Creek, then down Cedar Springs to Harwood, down Main, circle the courthouse, then out Stemmons Freeway to the trademark. After the Dallas appearance, of course, he goes to Austin, where tonight there will be a $100 a plate fundraising dinner, uh, the only event that's tagged as political in his uh, tour of Texas. However, there is feeling that uh, by some, especially his critics, that the entire uh, trip through Texas, the two-day five-speech tour, is political in that he's mending political fences here in Texas. Normally a trip from the uh, marquee downstairs up here takes about 30 seconds, but we assume he shakes hands with everyone in sight. And uh, we've just had word that he is entering now. We have not seen him yet, but we'll stand by let you know as soon as we do see him coming. Among those seated at the head table are Monsignor Vincent Wolf, who will give the invocation. You see him there talking to Fort Worth Mayor Pro Tem Willard Barr. That's Mrs. Barr between them. Down the table next to them are Judge Marvin B. Simpson, Jr. and his wife, Mrs. Simpson. Then the woman there on the right is Mrs. Kennard. Her husband is downstairs with the president. He will uh, enter the hall with him. The next lady is Mrs. John Connolly, of course. Her husband, too, will come in with the president, as will Mrs. Lyndon B. Johnson's husband. The next two seats are reserved for the president and Mrs. Kennedy. On the other side of the rostrum, you see Mayor Baird Friedman and his wife. And next to him would be uh, Attorney General and Mrs. Carr. 
Then Speaker, House Speaker Byron Tunnel. As you can see, who's who in Texas politics is here for this event today. Next to them are Mr. and Mrs. Marion L. Hicks. The next couple you will see are J Mr. and Mrs. Jack W. Melcher. This breakfast is being sponsored by the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce, and here is Milt Atkinson, Jr., director of the Fort Worth Chamber. And seated next to the Atkinsons are Mr. and Mrs. O.C. Yancey. Mr. Yancey's a labor leader in Fort Worth. And the man who will give the benediction is Dr. Granville T. Walker, uh, seated at the end of the table there. We've had several false starts, so to speak, that the president is coming. When he does, of course, there will be a large round of applause. And uh, the Eastern Hills High School Band, 79 members will break out with Hail to the Chief, so you'll have no doubt when he does arrive. When the President appeared out in the parking lot, he broke one of the cardinal rules of security. Uh, he, in fact, he broke it two or three times. He went out into the crowd, and of course, Secret Service men find this the most nervous time of any presidential appearance. As long as the Secret Service men can keep the crowd away from the President, they have a good chance of protecting him. But once he moves into a crowd. The Secret Service men are nearly immobilized in protecting him. Another rule is that anyone who approaches the president should have both hands visible and empty. And as you can tell in a crowd, there's no way to determine that. So whenever the president does move out into a crowd for handshaking and backslapping and changing, uh, exchanging pleasantries, he is always at the mercy of the crowd and the Secret Service is at its least effective position. On September 6, 1901, those two rules were broken, and it ended in tragedy. That was the day that President William McKinney was appearing at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. And at a public reception, the crowd moved in around him, and the three Secret Service men who were guarding him had no chance to screen the people approaching him. Because it was a hot day, Secret Service also allowed persons to have handkerchiefs in their hands to wipe their perspiring brows. It just so happened that one of the thousands of handkerchiefs in that large hall covered a revolver in the hand of 28-year-old Leon Cholgos. He was an unemployed mill worker. He said he was an anarchist. He was also uh, had a, was a man with a long history of mental illness. And as in many important occasions of the world, no one seemed to sense that anything different was going to happen. When McKinley reached out to shake Cholgols's hand, it looked like a familiar scene. The scene of the President of the United States shaking hands with Fred Nobody. The assassin shattered that picture quickly. He slapped McKinley's hand away and fired two shots point blank. In an instant, McKinley's attacker was driven to the floor. As the President was being helped to a chair, McKinley murmured, don't let them hurt him. Seven days later, McKinley was dead. Oddly enough, the assassination attempt was staged in the Temple of Music quite an ironical note, and there was a quiet box sonata being played in the background when the two fatal shots rang out. Now here comes Vice President Johnson, Governor Conley, Senator Ralph Yarborough, Congressman Jim Wright, State Senator Don Kennard. But still, the President has not arrived. You may have heard the drums roll in the background in anticipation of it. When the President walks in, they will play Hail to the Chief. And now we expect any moment now the President to enter the hall. From our vantage point, we can see a flurry of activity by Secret Service men in the kitchen, so we assume that as soon as the head table is seated, that is Governor Connolly, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, Senator Yarborough, and State Senator Don Kennard, and Congressman Jim Wright, the President, will enter the ballroom. One of the Secret Service men who is one of the key operators here has just stepped into the kitchen, so we assume he is preparing the way for the president. 
He was due to arrive in the ballroom at 9 o'clock, and if my watch is correct, it's now 9.10, so he's running about 10 minutes behind schedule. Just what effect this will have on the length of his speech, we do not know. As we said earlier, normally in such instances, the speech is tailored to fit the time available, and there's not much time available. Here comes the president. As you may have noticed, Mrs. Kennedy did not enter with the president. So far, we have no indication of where she may be. And I can tell you from where we are standing, there are quite a few ladies who appear to be quite disappointed that Mrs. Kennedy is not here. I am sure that if she does not appear, the president will explain uh, the reason for her absence. He may have changed his suit coat when he entered the building from the parking lot attendant uh, appearance across the street. He was quite damp from the rain. He was the only member of the official party that did not wear a raincoat. But as he walked by me here, I noticed that his coat was dry and there were no rain spots on it. So he may have gone to his suite to change uh, suit coat. Please. The invocation will be given by Monsignor Vincent J. Wolf. Monsignor Wolf. O eternal God, Father of these United States of America, we as a nation are grateful for our noble destiny. From the day of our initial consecration to thee, we have relied upon thine omnipotent providence, and under thy protection, we are now before the world a beacon of hope, a shrine of liberty and justice for all. Our founding fathers proclaim thee creator, and by that fact, our country promotes for each resident a liberty most absolute and an equality most entire. O oh God of might and wisdom, with thy spirit of counsel and fortitude. Assist our President of the United States that his administration will be useful and fruitful for the common good of thy people over whom he presides. And, O oh God, may we with him be thine instruments in establishing the divine harmony throughout the world so that thy sons and daughters from one end of the earth to the other may be free to join in the glorious hymn of worship. 
Glory be to thee, O God, in the highest, and on earth, peace. Now, O God, the giver of good gifts, we thank thee for the food which thou hast given for the nourishment of our bodies, the temples of our souls, made to thine image and likeness. Amen. Be seated, please. There's a lull in the program here as the next item on the agenda is straightened out. We still have no word from Secret Service men or White House aides as to why Mrs. Kennedy is not present at the breakfast. The man who introduced Monsignor Wolf is Raymond Buck, president of the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce. If everything goes according to schedule, the next item on the program will be a rendition by the Texas Boys Choir. In a situation like this, the best a reporter can do is guess sometimes, but we've been watching the head table closely, and so far there's been no coffee placed at Mrs. Kennedy's spot at the table, and uh, no breakfast has been set down. So this indicates that she will not appear. Now, once again, here's Mr. Buck. Ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to see you all here this morning, and we now are going to have the pleasure of hearing from... Fort Worth's finest, the Texas Boys Choir. It's strange how in situations like this, a uh, relatively minor character can become so important. Quite a few people in the ballroom are watching the maitre d'. He's the short man that's walking back and forth behind the head table. He put a plate in front of Vice President Johnson. He put one in front of Kennedy. And quite a few people noted that so far there is no plate at the place of Mrs. Kennedy. He's pouring coffee. As he moves down the line again, he did not stop at Mrs. Kennedy's place. Was a 
received word from one of the president's aides that Mrs. Kennedy is on her way down and apparently this is what's caused the delay because uh, there are additional selections by the Texas Boys Choir not scheduled for the program and uh, as far as we can determine she will enter the same way the president did through the kitchen door that you see for security reasons. One minute ago we were told she'd be down in 30 seconds so uh, as you can see uh, we are just standing by until she arrives. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct privilege to introduce or to present to you the guests at the head table, leaving for the moment those that you'll hear from later. First of all, it is a personal pleasure for me to present the most gallant, able Texan of them all, one who has done so much for Texas and America, the distinguished Vice President of the United States, Lyndon B. Johnson. And his lovely wife, companion, Lady Bird. <laughs> Next, we have the pleasure of presenting Fort Worth's own, the talented governor of Texas, Governor John B. Connolly. and his sweet wife, Nellie. We're honored to have with us today the distinguished and able senior citizen of Texas, Senator Ralph W. Yarbrough. We have had many able congressmen from the, this district, none of which have ever surpassed in dedication 
<coughs> loyalty and capability to country and to district, the Honorable Jim Wright. West Texan, the people's lawyer, Attorney General Wagoner Carr. And the attractive Mrs. Carr. Guiding our House of Representatives with a firm hand and with great success is our speaker, Byron Tunnell. And his wife, Mrs. Tunnell. Near, near here on my left, the able, dedicated, hardworking, mayor of this vibrant and vigorous city who is giving us a tremendous administration as mayor, Mayor Baird H. Friedman. <laughs> and his wife, Mrs. Friedman. Only one county in the United States, I have been told, is free of debt, Mr. President, and that is Tarrant County. <laughs> Represented here this morning by our county judge, Marvin B. Simpson, Jr. <laughs> and Mrs. Simpson. Assisting, substituting at times for our mayor, we have a very fine mayor pro tem. He's been a leader here in political and business circles for many years, Willard Barr. <laughs> and Mrs. Barr. In the state senate, we are ably and vigorously represented by our Senator Don Kennard. And Mrs. Kennard. In the Chamber of Commerce, my work has been made easy by the able assistance of the vice presidents and the staff, directors, members. Here this morning it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Marion L. Hicks, vice president of the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> and General Dynamics. <laughs> and, and Mrs. Hicks. Also of tremendous value, assistance to the Chamber of Commerce the last two years has been our Vice President Jack W. Melcher of Lennox Manufacturing Company and Mrs. Melcher. The fellow who really does the hard work at the Chamber of Commerce and who I believe is, well, he's finally come up to take his seat. He's been out there working. He's our very talented Milton A. Atkinson, Vice President and General Manager. And Mrs. Atkinson. The 
The Central Trades Council and the Building and Construction Trades are ably represented here in Fort Worth by Mr. O.C. Yancey, President of Central Trades Council, and Mrs. Yancey. Completes the introductions, except for those who have spoken or will speak later. Now is an event that I know all of you have been waiting for. from the reaction, that's Mrs. Kennedy coming in. She's been standing outside in the kitchen waiting for the introduction of the guests at the head table to be completed. Now she is moving up to the front of the ballroom, mounting the dyes. For the ladies in the audience, she's wearing a pink outfit trimmed in black. Uh, if I knew more about it, I'd tell you the kind of material. It looks like a nubby material, uh, wool of some type. And with the chilly weather outside today, this is probably uh, very appropriate. There's some very happy women here today who made the trip down. Ladies and gentlemen, I proudly present the President of the United States. I know uh, now why everyone in Texas, Fort Worth, is so thin. I've gotten up and down about uh, nine times. <laughs> this is what you do every morning. Mr. Buck, Mr. Vice President, Governor Conley, Senator Yarborough, Jim Wright, members of the Congressional Delegation, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Attorney General, ladies and gentlemen. Two years ago, I said that, uh, introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. <laughs> Nobody wonders what Lyndon and I wear. But we're... I'm glad to be here in uh, Jim Wright City, about uh, 35... Uh... About uh, 35 years ago, a congressman from California, just been elected, received a letter from an irate constituent which said, uh, during your campaign, you promised to have the Sierra Madre Mountains reforested. You've been in office for one month and you haven't done so. <laughs> well, no one in Fort Worth has been uh, that unreasonable, but in some ways he has had the Sierra Madre Mountains reforested. And uh, here in Fort Worth, he's contributed to its growth. He speaks for Fort Worth. He speaks for the country. And I don't know any city that's better represented in the Congress of the United States than Fort Worth. And if there are any Democrats here this morning, I'm sure you won't hold that against them. <laughs> Three years ago, last September, I came here on uh, the Vice President and spoke at uh, Burke Burnett Park. And I called in that speech for a national security policy and a national security system which was second to none. A position which said not first, but, if, when, and how, but first. That city responded to that call as it has through its history. And we have been putting that pledge into practice ever since. And I want to say a word about that pledge here in Fort Worth. 
which understands national defense and its importance to the security of the United States. During the days of the Indian War, this city was a fort. During the days of World War I, even before the United States got into the war, Royal Canadian Air Force pilots were training here. During the days of World War II, the great Liberator bombers, on which my brother flew with his co-pilot from this city, were produced here. The first non-stop flight around the world took off and returned here in a plane built in factories here. The first truly intercontinental bomber, the B-36, was produced here. The B-58, which is the finest weapon system in the world today, which it demonstrated most recently in flying from Tokyo to London with an average speed of nearly a thousand miles per hour, is a Fort Worth product. The Iroquois helicopter from Fort Worth is a mainstay in our fight against the guerrillas in South Vietnam. The transportation of crews between our missile sites is done in planes produced here in Fort Worth. So wherever the confrontation may occur, and in the last three years it's occurred at least three occasions, in Laos, in Berlin, and in Cuba, and it will again, wherever it occurs, the products of Fort Worth and the men of Fort Worth provide us with a sense of security. And in the not too distant future, And in the not too distant future, a new Fort Worth product. And I'm glad that there was a table separating Mr. Hicks and myself. A new Fort Worth product. The TFX, Tactical Fighter Experimental. Nobody knows what those words mean, but that's what they mean. Tactical Fighter experimental will serve the forces of freedom and will be the number one airplane in the world today. There's been a good deal of discussion of the long and hard fought competition to win the TFX contract, but very little discussion about what this plane will do. It will be the first operational aircraft ever produced that can literally spread its wings through the air. It will thus give us a single plane capable of carrying out missions of speed as well as distance, able to fly very far in one form or very fast in another. It can take off from rugged, short airstrips, enormously increasing the Air Force's ability to participate in limited wars. The same basic plane will serve the Navy's carriers saving the taxpayers at least one billion dollars in cost if they built separate planes for the Navy and the Air Force. The government of Australia, by purchasing hundred and twenty-five million dollars of TFX planes before they are even off the drawing boards, has already testified to the merit of this plane and at the same time it's confident in the ability of Fort Worth to meet its schedule. In all these ways, the success of our national defense depends upon this city in the western United States, 10,000 miles from Vietnam, five or 6,000 miles from Berlin, thousands of miles from trouble spots in Latin America, in Africa, or the Middle East. And yet Fort Worth and what it does and what it produces participates in all these great historic events. Texas as a whole, and Fort Worth bear a particular responsibility for this national defense effort. For military procurement in this state totals nearly one and a quarter billion dollars, fifth highest among all the states of the Union. There are more military personnel on active duty in this state than any in the nation save one. And it's not Massachusetts. Any in the nation... <laughs> Say one with a <laughs> with a combined military civilian defense payroll of well over a billion dollars. I don't recite these for any partisan purpose. 
They're the result of American determination to be second to none. And as a result of the effort which this country has made in the last three years, we are second to none. In the past three years, we have increased the defense budget of the United States by over 20 percent, increased the program of acquisition for Polaris submarines from 24 to 41, increased our Minuteman missile purchase program by more than 75 percent, doubled the number of strategic bombers and missiles on alert, doubled the number of nuclear weapons available in the strategic alert forces, increased the tactical nuclear forces deployed in Western Europe by over 60 percent, added five combat ready divisions to the armies of the United States and five tactical fighter wings to the Air Force of the United States, increased our strategic airlift capability by 75 percent and increased our special counterinsurgency forces which are engaged now in South Vietnam by 600 percent. I hope those who want a strong America and place it on some signs will also place those figures next to it. This is not an easy effort. This requires sacrifice by the people of the United States. But this is a very dangerous and uncertain world. As I said earlier, on three occasions in the last three years, the United States has had a direct confrontation. No one can say uh, when it will come again. No one expects uh, that uh, our life will be easy. Certainly not in this decade, and perhaps not in this century. But we should realize what a burden and responsibility the people of the United States have borne for so many years. Here, a country which lived in isolation, divided and protected by the Atlantic and the Pacific, uninterested in the struggles of the world around it, here in the short space of 18 years after the Second World War, we put ourselves by our own will and by necessity into defensive alliances with countries all around the globe. Without the United States, South Vietnam would collapse overnight. Without the United States, the CETO alliance would collapse overnight. Without the United States, the CETO alliance would collapse overnight. Without the United States, there would be no NATO, and gradually Europe would drift into neutralism and indifference. Without the effort of the United States and the Alliance for Progress, the communist advance onto the mainland of South America would long ago have taken place. So this country, which desires only to be free, which desires to be secure, which desires to live at peace for 18 years under three different administrations, has borne more than its share of the burden, has stood watch for more than its number of years. I don't think that uh, we are fatigued or tired. We would like to live uh, as we once lived, but history will not permit it. The communist balance of power is still uh, strong. The balance of power is still on the side of freedom. We are still the keystone and the arch of freedom. And I think we will continue to do as we have done in our past, our duty. And uh, the people of Texas will be in the lead. So I'm glad to come. I'm glad to come to this uh, state, which has played uh, such a significant role in so many efforts in this century, and to say that here in Fort Worth, you people will be playing a major role in the maintenance of the security of the United States for the next 10 years. I'm confident, as I look uh, to the future, that our chances for security, our chances for peace, are better than they've been in the past. And the reason is because we're stronger. And with that strength is a determination to not only maintain the peace, but also the vital interests of the United States. To that great cause, Texas and the United States are committed. Thank you.
President, your visit with us in Fort Worth today, the things you have said have refreshed and renewed our appreciation of your great leadership and courage. You have brought rain <laughs> to moisten our pastures and our fields. You have brought sunshine in our hearts. No, we know that you don't wear a hat. <laughs> Couldn't let you leave Fort Worth without providing you with some protection against the rain. in the uh, White House on Monday. If you'll come up there, you'll have a chance to see it then. <laughs> that, uh, that Texas hat is presented to you by Washer Brothers, one of the oldest men's stores in Texas. And to protect you against local enemies, in the manner that you are protecting this nation against our foreign enemies and to keep the rattlesnakes on Vice President Johnson's ranch from striking you, we want to present these, this pair of boots. <laughs> we won't ask you to put them on. Here. Boots are presented by Mr. John Justin, former mayor of Fort Worth, manufacturer of the most walked about boots in the world. <laughs> and Mrs. Kennedy, as you ride to the hounds or walk to the rattlesnakes, <laughs> we want you to have protection too. Before the benediction, I'd like to present Mrs. Granville Walker, the wife of Dr. Granville Walker, who will pronounce the benediction. Mrs. Granville Walker. <laughs> After Dr. Walker gives the benediction, we we'll ask that you please remain seated until the president and Mrs. Kennedy have made their exit. Dr. Granville Walker. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. The Lord bless all nations with a desire for peace. The Lord bless our own beloved nation with rectitude and prosperity and grant us to achieve justice for all within it. The Lord bless our president and all in places of responsibility with wisdom and with health equal to their tasks. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace both now and forever. Amen. This has been the presidential breakfast from the Hotel Texas in Fort Worth. Now the presidential party will leave Fort Worth, go to Dallas, where this afternoon 
he will address a crowd at the Trademart. This program has been an origination of the KTVT remote facilities.